same link is there. Yes. Okay, so are we going live now? There is still a minute to go, I believe. Ah, Ravi Shankar. The friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age and guide of youth, Few hearts like his with virtue warm, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there's none, he made the best of this. On behalf of Honorable Dr. J.B. Singh's family, Eltai, and the entire English teaching fraternity, I, Ravi Shankar, take this honor and privilege to welcome you all on board for the 8th Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture Series. This is... Ramak answer the video. Parting is always painful, and when it is of a soulmate, it is even more painful. Yet, some souls never depart. They reverberate and keep regenerating the generations. Dr. J.B. Singh, sir, was one such soul. To share her innermost emotions and feelings now, I invite Dr. Savita Singh, ma'am, wife of Honorable Dr. J.B. Singh, sir, to at Government Science College, Raipur, and an invited faculty at School of Study experience in this field has 16 PhD awarded under her able guidance. She has published about 30 national and international research books, two as a co-authors, Zora Niall's Hurston, A Life Coming Full Circle, Inside Lives, a psychoanalytical study of Ruskin Bond's short stories. She has been the convener of Eltai, Raipur chapter, and here are a few lines for Dr. Savita Singh, ma'am. Jovial and bright, her laughter rings true, dispelling shadows, painting skies anew. Through trials and tests, she strides with grace, each hurdle met with a determined face. I now invite on board Dr. Savita Singh, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ravi Shankar. Good evening, Pranam and Jai Johar from Raipur, Chhattisgarh, the tribal heart of India. Wishing all of you a happy Hindu New Year. It is with a sense of deep joy and profound gratitude that I welcome all of you to this program the eighth edition of the Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture. The topic today, 
arts in the time of AI's Aristotle and Hamlet's Android phone is extremely interesting, very relevant and very futuristic. I would like to begin with a quote from one of my favorite poems, H. W. Longfellow's A Psalm of Life. Life so great men all remind us, we can make our life sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. I actually love the next stanza more. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. This memorial lecture series pays tribute to a man who put many lives on the right track during his lifetime and he continues to guide even from heaven above. He is remembered with love and nostalgia by everyone whose lives he had touched. This lecture series is significant as he was a teacher, a principal, the founder of a school and a college, and he spent his entire life serving him. He homage to him and endeavor to walk on the footprints he has left behind on the sands of time. Esteemed speaker, Dr. Prantik Banerjee from Hislop College, really acclaimed and revered professor. Welcome, sir. Really grateful to you for accepting our invite. I welcome Mr. Vishwadeep Shukla, an educationist and an administrator and a very, very close family friend. I welcome Mr. Ravind Devedi, who is joining us across timelines all the way from the US. He is an alumnus of Rajkumar College and a devoted student of J.P. Singh, sir. I welcome Anurima Das also, who is joining in from Berlin, Germany. I welcome Dr. Shukla Banerjee, retired professor of English, deeply respected and loved in Chhattisgarh and in national academic fraternities. Uh, that the audience contributes to the success of any program. Welcome, dear participants. I thank uh, all the members of the Eltai Raipur chapter for always standing by at my side and be making each and every program that we decide to have a success. It is said that life partnerships are drafted in heaven and the terms and conditions and the span of the partnership is ordained by the powers that be. No one the Almighty's will the world complies silently. Jeevan Mrityu Vidhi Hart. I end with Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Dr. J.B. Singh, my dear husband, lived each stage of his life to the fullest, to the least. His life is his message. I request all of you to really enjoy and live your lives. Live in the present, live it to the fullest. Once again, I welcome one and all present here. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You can remember him and only feel that he is gone or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back or you can do what he would want, smile, open your eyes, love and go on. Now, I invite Dr. Sunaina Misha to share her tribute to Dr. J. B. Singh. Dr. Sunaina Mishra has an impressive 43 years of teaching experience. She is currently serving as assistant professor at Government Nagarjun PG College of Science, Raipur. Dr. Sunaina Mishra's scholarly contributions extend 
Beyond the Classroom with over 30 papers published in esteemed national and international journals. Her seminal work, Paramparik Dharohar, delves into rituals, traditions, and festivals of Sanatan Dharma, intertwining legends with scientific significance, earning widespread acclaim. She has been honored with the Best Teacher Award from Government College Patan, Durg University. She is an All India radio artist and a celebrated creative message writer. We welcome you on board, ma'am. Over to you, please. Thank you, Ravi Shankar. A very good evening to all present. Uh, telling about Dr. J.P. Singh in few words is very, very difficult. But still, I try my level best. To start with, I'll say he's the far Eltai Raipur chapter. I still remember when we thought of joining Eltai Raipur chapter, he was the first person who gave us the field where we could start up with. And he was the backbone of Eltai chapter till his last. So we should say that he's the father of the Eltai Raipur chapter. We've gathered here today to honor the memory of the late Dr. Jen Bahadur Singh, a titan in the field of education, whose legacy continues to inspire us. Born on 28, 1953, into the esteemed lineage of Rajkumar Shankar Bahadur Singh and Anpurna Devi of the royal family of Kheragar, Dr. Singh's contribution to education were profound and far-reaching. Educated at Rajkumar College, Raipur, Dr. Singh embarked on a journey marked by unwavering dedication and unparalleled achievements. His pursuit of knowledge led him to complete his undergraduate studies in science at Allahabad University followed by MSc in Mathematics and LLB from Digvijay. His academic prowess was further acknowledged with trade from Colombia, Sri Lanka. Dr. Singh's ascent in the realm of education was nothing short of remarkable. Starting as a simple teacher in 1978, he rose to the prestigious position of principal of Rajkumar College in 1995 where he served with distinction for an unprecedented, leaving an indelible mark on the institution's history since its establishment in 1882. A visionary leader, he played a pivotal role in founding Royal Kids Convent and Royal College in Rajnangam, shaping the educational landscape for generations to come. Throughout his illustrious career, Dr. Singh received numerous awards and held significance in the ICSC Board of Education and IPSC Association of Public Schools. His multifaceted persona resonated with versatility, compassion, and dedication. Revered as a compassionate human being, a devoted teacher, and an astute administrator, he touched the lives of countless individuals with his kindness and wisdom. As we gather here for the J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture, let us reflect on Dr. Jain Bahadur Singh's enduring legacy and the profound impact he continues to have on the lives of those he touched. May his memory to inspire and guide us in our pursuit of knowledge and excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Ravishankar. Thank, Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma this event is being organized under the banner of Eltai Raipur chapter. This has been one of the most active chapters overall. To tell you more about its exploits, now I invite Dr. Anil Maji on board. Dr. Anil Maji is a distinguished faculty member at National Institute of Technology, Raipur, with seven years of experience as an assistant professor
Justice. I now invite Dr. Anil Maji on board to give a briefing about the events and activities of the English Language Teachers Association, Raipur chapter. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Shankar Panikar, sir. Thank you. Uh, warm good evening to one and all. To mention, the English Language Teachers Association of India is a prominent professional organization dedicated to the advancement of English language teaching and learning in India. Founded in 1969 by founding father, late Padam Shri S. Natarajan, LTI serves as a platform for English language educators, researchers, and professionals to exchange ideas, share best practices, and stay updated on the latest trends in the field of English language education. So in this August online gathering, I express my delight to be a member of this LTI Raipur chapter, one of the strongest branches of the giant LTI tree. In fact, it is truly a moment of honor for me to introduce LTI Raipur chapter. Inaugurated in the annals of time, LTI Raipur chapter embarked on its noble journey in the year 2012. Since its inception, LTI Raipur chapter has flourished exponentially, expanding its reach and influence out to the English teachers of gathering minds from far and wide to engage in scholarly discourse and transformative dialogue in English language amongst the students and teachers of the region and its members in every conceivable way, leaving no stones unturned in its quest for excellence in English language education, Oops, conferences, lecture series, and so on, which uh, affirms Altai Rapu chapter's enduring commitment to fulfilling its mission. Given the time constraints, I have handpicked a few activities to be mention before you all. Under the aegis of Altai Rapu chapter, which was sponsored by Oxford University Press on English language teaching, was organized on 24th March 2012, in which Dr. Chumki Biswas was the resource person. Further, one day workshop on common errors in English vocabulary was organized at College of Nursing, Ames, Raipur, on 5th November 2015. And on 25th November 2015, teaching, speaking techniques, and poetry appreciation was organized, where Mrs. Mala Palani was the resource person. If we talk about the legacy of Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture Series, it began on 27th February 2017 in the fond memory of our Dr. J.B. Singh, sir in which the resource person was Dr. Gautam Ghoshal, an erudite scholar and professor of English at Vishwabharati University, Shanti Niketan. He delivered his lecture on the integral psychology of Sri Aurobindo. Till now, Altai Raipu chapter has organized seven Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture Series, in which we were fortunate enough to have the privilege of listening to esteemed professors like Dr. B.K. Tripathi, sir, professor and head Sambalpur University, who spoke on academic administration in the year 2018. And in the year 2019, Dr. Chitranjan Karsar, former professor and head Department of Language, Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University, spoke on concepts of semiotics. In 2020, we had Dr. S.Z.H. Abidi, sir, former professor and head of Lucknow University, who enlightened us on the topic of the concept of Orientalism and Patriarchism and Gender Politics in Renaissance Poetry. Similarly, on 3rd April 2021, a webinar was organized on Rendezvous with Mahesh Dattani, which satiated the audience's appetite for the knowledge of literature. In 2022, Dr. Dinesh Nair, sir, was there, uh, assistant professor from BG Wage College, Mullen, Mumbai, who spoke on the topic of botanical imagination, vegetal bodies in poetry. And recently in 2023, we had Mr. Samir Divansa, who dwelled into the topic of brighter and bleaker sides of journalism, along with Mr. B. K. S. Ray, who addressed the topic of creativity, challenges, and responses. Also, we were lucky enough to have a glimpse of Dr. R. K. Banerjee, sir's painting in painting exhibition. Now here, we have gathered together to witness another mesmerizing moment Yes, the eighth Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Lecture on a very wonderful topic which would leave us amazed. That is, Arts in the Times of AIs, Aristotle and Hamlet's Android Phone. 
in which our very own Dr. Pranthik Benerji, sir, professor of English from Hislop College, Nagpur, is the resource person who will spellbound us with his amazing lecture. The credit for organizing this eight lecture series goes to the able uh, patronship of Dr. Savita Singh, ma'am, assistant professor and head of the Department of English, Government Nagarjun, PG College of Sciences, Raipur, and to Dr. Shilpi Bhattacharya, ma'am, President, Altai Rapu Chapter, Professor in School of Arts and Humanities, Department of English at Kalinga University. Also to Dr. Sunaina Mishra, ma'am, Vice President of Altai Rapu Chapter, Assistant Professor in the Department of Nagarjuna PG College of Sciences, Raipur. And to Dr. Shashank Gupta, sir, Secretary, Altai Rapu Chapter, is Assistant Professor in Department of English, Government J. Yogandam Chhattisgarh College, Raipur. And to Dr. Ravi Shankar Panikar, sir, Joint Secretary, Altai Raipur Chapter, Senior Assistant Professor and Head of Department of Humanities at Bhilai Institute of Technology, Raipur. And to all professors and dedicated team of passionate members and participants that the Altai Raipur Chapter is reaching to greater heights. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass, pass on the baton to Dr. Ravi Shankar Panikar, sir, for rowing further the course of program. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Anil, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. J.B. Singh, sir, was like a magic wand. The lives he touched shall forever remain in his spell. One such educationist and a stalwart we have amidst us who would like to share his unforgettable times with sir. I invite Sri Vichwadeep Chukla, sir, to share his thoughts. In all over 37 years of teaching experience in the field of education, Vishwadeep Chukla sir completed his college education from the Hindu College, Delhi University, and then joined RKC in 1984 as a teacher in humanities. Over the years, sir has been played an instrumental role in various capacities at Rajkumar College and finally joined as a principal in Kendri Vidyale in 1997, worked till 2021. One of the things that is worth mentioning is that the lectures in his lectures in English, history, and political science are being recorded by the websites like YouTube. Over 700 videos, as on date, has already been posted in YouTube. We welcome you on board, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Panikkar. Well, time constraint being there, I'll be just speaking on my very close association with Mr. J.B. Singh. And I'm going to speak here ex tempore with no prior preparation as such, because that will uh, not be have very informal kind of uh, him. I've had the pleasure of being with him right from 1984, the year I joined. And that was the time when I was a very introvert person, a subdued kind of guy coming to Rajkumar College, you know, from a small town to a school, which was, you know, uh, uh, which has a totally different culture. Care of uh, me in the sense that he ensured that I stay on. And that speaks of one of the facets of JB's persona. The fact that he would touch everyone's life, which is being spoken here and will be spoken in times to come, is, uh, is the reflection of my this incident or example is the reflection of that. Well, ever since we were together, I have seen Ms. JB Singh or I saw Ms. JB Singh in a very, very, you uh, know, uh, uh, what to say, variety of roles as a mentor, as a teacher, as a friend, as a leader, as a team person, and of course, as one who is in Hindi, if I'm permitted to say in English Memorial Lecture, a Bindas guy. He was absolutely, he believed in live life king size, and that was his motto. What is this that you live life for 100 years like sheep? So that was his life and that is something that touched my heart. And, you know, I, I literally submitted to him in the sense that I would spend as much time with him as was possible. During the initial years from 1985-86, you'll be surprised to know with the kind of with Mr. JB that we all know, there was another thing which was not known, which is not known to much. He was a fantastic player of Scrabble. So much so that uh, me and Ms. JB, Mrs. JB were partner and Mrs. JB Singh with partner with somebody else. We would start playing Scrabble 
from around 9 9:30 and go up to 3 o'clock 3 o'clock 4 o'clock or so and back to the warden duty late at night we would play we would fight out for every point opening up dictionaries after dictionaries shouting for it fighting for it and you know jb was there and he would not budge an inch when it comes came to a particular word if he knew that this is the answer he would be very particular in making sure that we lose and scrabble and jb is something i believe is not known to much mr jb singh was known for as i said bindas like and there academically he was so much oriented behind the curtain is a reflection of his overall personality well this apart uh, mr jb singh uh, had a very personal relations with me in the sense that i was uh, i'll tell you some two three small incident because i have been introduced here as one who was very close to mr jb singh without touching much on literary aspect of this um, you know uh, memorial um, uh, program uh, i was to get married to who became my wife later and uh, it was it was you know known that she is going to be my wife and she was posted about 70 80 kilometers away from here and i didn't know where she was working it was mr jb singh who suddenly comes up one early morning tells me shukla can we go somewhere i said where he said well let's go to look for your would be i said i don't know i'm i was introvert as i said and he said come on let's get in he brought the scooter with side car on and on a side car we drove down right up to 70 km and i said where she is working i really do not know some school she is working all i know is that much and the government schools in village interior areas are far far away how do you make out how do you find out well i was made to sit near a river bed i think mrs savita singh was also there bhavi ji was also there with me and we were sitting by the side of a river we waited and waited and lo i suddenly saw ms jb coming with my would be uh, driving on you know a uh, side car and said yeah aa gayi hai my god that was jb that was jb well that apart ms jb singh was a very uh, a pakka team leader he would never say i i've never heard him saying ever i did it no he always <coughs> said we did it he would never work for getting some kind of honor or award or something and not for the sake of ribbon code or selfish hope of a season's fame play up play up and play the game i think that's one very well known poem in english and that's what he would do he would always work for enhancement total enhancement and give credit to the team players to everyone not taking credit solely for himself over the years we also saw jb singh performing one role after another as teacher as administrator and also on stage not a stage of life alone but stage of the uh, now sto hall rajkumar college where he would perform one program after another uh, if i am permitted there are two three lines which uh, uh, i would speak in hindi because they were in hindi and that's what they ma- it makes it so famous uh, पैरोडी बनाने में जेबी सिंह सर का बड़ा विश्वास था ही ही वुड मेक ग्रेट पैरोडीज ऑन वन ऑफ द फंक्शंस ही सेड नो दैट ये आर के सी हम नहीं छोड़ेंगे छोड़ेंगे दम मगर आर के सी नहीं छोड़ेंगे दैट इज द कमिटमेंट दैट ही हैड दैट इज द स्पिरिट ही हैड फॉर हिज इंस्टीट्यूशन फॉर हिज एल्मा मेटर एंड एवरीथिंग r r r k c was like something which was it was much bigger activity stage for him and he would say ki tak dhana din tak dhana din ye teri hai r r r k c meri hai he would own up that ownership was there in him and it is this ownership that he ensured gets cultivated in everyone who was around him everybody was influenced by that and these parodies these lines would make sure that he lives in the minds of people forever even today after 30 years or 35 years i still remember these lines because they speak of his commitment they speak of his belongingness as for the team spirit is concerned you know esprit de corps 
uh, NCC motto is there. And that spirit he would exhibit in every fora. Wherever he would go, he would make sure that he takes the people along. He believed that in the court, if I put it correctly, uh, do not follow me, for I cannot lead you. Do not walk behind me, for I cannot lead you. Do not walk ahead of me, for I cannot follow you. Walk by my side and be my friend. So he was a companion. He had a great sense of companionship in him. And that is what is something that I, as a principal, when I started my career <coughs> as principal, I had every time this in mind. And thanks to late Mr. J.B. Singh, that these things kept coming into me, kept motivating me, kept me you know, sort of uh, at the, on the right path. Okay, well, this is what needs to be done. Well, I think uh, uh, one more example that I would like to give here is uh, those days, all the boys were boarders. And by virtue of being bolder, they were required to be engaged around the clock. Uh, Ravind and uh, Ajayan would all know. And to engage, it was necessary that they are shown films every fortnight or maybe one Saturday night somewhere in the old kind of uh, uh, those uh, projectors. Those projectors would go off, go out of order after some time. But then it was Mr. J.B. Singh who would make sure, spending hours and hours together, that he remains in the hall where those heavy projectors were kept and he would see to it that they get repaired. He would do it himself. What was the need? Care for so many boarders who were missing out their families. Then came the DVD age. And in DVD age, children would, you know, we, we being warden, they would just jump on us and they will uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, demand that we be shown some cinema and we would turn out there. I mean, uh, we would not accept their plea. The moment JV would learn to it, this point, he would come back. He would say, OK, you people don't want to sit. I will sit with the children to make sure that they watch that cinema. In other words, he was a humane person. He was a person who has touched everybody's cord, as somebody said. Are full of students who are full of praise for him. And when I see that, I feel inspired. Because during my tenure as principal for 25 years, I feel probably on that level, at, on that point issue, I ran little short of uh, the expectations from the students, of the students, the way JB did. He would make sure that everybody is heard, everybody is consoled, everybody is uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, touched upon. So with these words, I thank this organization for having invited me and for having given me the opportunity to recall my good old days, my association with late Mr. J.B. Singh. I remember him very fondly. Thank you, Savita Bhaviji, and thanks to all the team members, Dr. Panikar and everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It was really very touching. Rajkumar College was like a rich orchid for Dr. J.B. Singh, sir where he nurtured, kindled, and groomed talents right from their childhood. One such gentleman with us will remember his school day's memory to recall on this day. We have Amit Sats, Mr. Ravindra Devedi, all the way from USA. After completing his high school in 2001 from RKC, Ravindra Devedi graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering and owes a master's of science degree in visualization from Texas A&M University, United States of America. Ravindra has been in the animation industry for about 13 years, and his career span includes working at leading animation companies such as Walt Disney, Animation, Real FX, and Blue Sky Studios, a, a kind of uh, some envious stuff. Currently, he works as a senior effects artist at Pixar Animation Studios. His movie credits include Wreck It Ralph, Rio 2, The Peanuts Movie, Ferdinand, etc. We welcome you, sir. Over to you, Mr. Ravindra. 
A very good morning from California. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Savita, ma'am, and introducing me, Ravi Shankar, sir. Uh, it is truly an honor to have been given this opportunity to say a few words uh, for our beloved Mr. J.V. Singh. <laughs> Uh, before I start, I just wanted to uh, also mention, like, it's really great to see, you know, like, familiar faces, like, uh, so, for example, uh, Shukla said, like, he was my history teacher, and I remember, like, I didn't like history that much, but the year he joined, and he, I still remember, like, he, you know, like, he started his lecture with telling a story about how this one, like, uh, great emperor was lost, and, you know, like, archaeologists, like, you know, uh, uh, like, started to find these little uh, in, inscriptions and this and that, and that little discovery of Ashok, like he told everything in the story form, and you know that was uh, I, I really fell in love with history after that. So yeah, you know, it, it's really an honor to like uh, you know Thank you. to uh, be here with him. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, you know, every teacher leaves an impression in our lives, uh, however small it may be, but we tend to remember only a handful of them as we grow old. Perhaps they are the ones who have had the greatest impact and touched our lives in ways we cannot imagine. Mr. J.B. Singh was an integral part of our lives, and it is impossible to think of our precious moments in school without thinking of him. It is difficult to pen down his impact on our lives in just a few words, uh, but given the time constraint, I will try. There is an incident which I want to share. Um, to give a little con context, I was a boarder in Rashma College for the entire 12 years of my school life. I don't recall the year on this one, uh, but I was in senior school and it was the annual prize giving ceremony. And um, I was in a queue to receive a prize for an academic achievement. And uh, JB sir walked towards me and told me that he felt really proud when voters won academic prizes since he understood how much we sacrificed our time away from family. You know, and, and um, Mr. Shukla tells a little bit on, on this, uh, you know, how empathetic. Um, and caring he was. And, it, and these moments, you know, really show that. He knew how to guide students on the right path uh, to inspire them. Uh, and the best of all, he knew the how. I have had the pleasure to interact with him over the years when I was a child, through my teenage years, all the way up to when I was about to graduate high school. He knew how to speak to these different versions of myself, if I may call them in ways that uh, would lift my spirit and motivate me to keep pushing forward. He became a friend as we grew older. It was incredible. I have had so many fond memories of um, having fun with him during dramatics and football tournaments and you know various celebrations. He valued honesty, integrity, and hard work. And one could see how dedicated he was to the school. He was a born leader, no, there's no doubt about that who deeply cared about students, his peers, and all the people he loved, and he really enjoyed his job. Was his favorite parody based off of Sholay's, ye dosti nahi, hum nahi chodenge, you know, which Mr. Shukla also talked about. <laughs> so you can see when multiple people talk about <laughs> how, how much he loved. Like, um, and sure enough, enough, you know, he never left RKC and Arkations whose life he, he deeply touched. I'm just grateful and feel lucky that I've had an opportunity to know him and spend some time with him. His teachings and care will always be my inspiration wherever I go. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ravindra. This reminds me of uh, just sing a line from a song. Actually, this is what feels true. It's time to remember one more good soul that us for heavenly board last year. Now, I invite Dr. Savita Singh Ma'am to pay tribute to Dr. R.K. Banerjee, husband of Dr. Chukla Banerjee. Ma'am, please. Dr. Banerjee, Dr. R.K. Banerjee, we used to all call him Dr. Sahab Jijaji because Shukla is always called Deep when he left us last year. And the video is also available on YouTube where we displayed his paintings in the last JBC Memorial Lecture. So he spoke uh, about my husband and he, his all his paintings were displayed and he was really very happy. And so like a year on, he's no longer missed us. So it's something very shocking, very sad for all of us. And especially when we think of Shukladi. But nothing can be done. So I'll just introduce him. 
आई जस्ट प्रे माई ट्रिब्यूट एंड रिस्पेक्ट टू हिम बहुत हम लोग को उन्होंने प्यार दिया बहुत आशीर्वाद और बहुत प्यार ऑलवेज ऑलवेज He was the only son of the family. Dr. Ravindra Kumar Banerjee was a doctor by profession, practitioner for 50 years, and he practiced for 50 years. And he was an excellent do- doctor. Like wherever my children used to be studying, maybe in the U.S. or wherever. Uh, but uh, he used to be just listening to the symptoms and giving them the medicines, and my kids used to be fine. So that was Doctor Saab in where we talk about diagnosis. So fifty years as a doctor, he was a very adorable father, a very good son, and a very good husband. He transcended everyone in greatness. He was an excellent speaker and a very very good painter. He has made three hundred and forty paintings. He was very popular for his paintings on Facebook. I'm Anurima Das to introduce our guest speaker of today's evening. Before that, I would like to share that Anurima Das hails from Raipur and has pursued her bachelor's in arts from LAD College Nagpur and master's in English from Hislop College Nagpur and has worked as an assistant professor of English at Kalinga University Raipur. She is currently pursuing her PhD from Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University. along with her literary pursuit she is also a budding ux designer based in berlin germany and have completed several google certified courses in ux and un ui design anrima would be joining us from berlin i now invite ms anrima das on board over to you ma'am thank you panika sir thank you for the introduction good evening to all I am Anurma Das and I am here before you today because I have the golden opportunity to introduce our speaker for today's event. Dr. Prantik Banerjee is a professor of English Hislop College Nagpur. He tries to make his students romance with language and literature. He encourages young minds to break rules in his classes for he believes that you cannot be creative unless you are a habitual rule breaker he has written insightful essays on viruses google babies comics cyborgs chiclet films ai and techno romance and other things that we call pop tech culture his books on culture politics history and literature despite the new virus of cancel culture are prescribed as textbooks and reference material his publications include nine books 12 book chapters and 46 research chap- papers in peer reviewed journals his recent books are a handbook of research in english studies teaching of culture and culture of teaching cultural studies texts and contexts theories in praxis discourses in literature and culture Culture studies, texts and contexts, theory in praxis, and teaching of culture are now listed as reference books in the University of Columbia, Princeton, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. He has been a member of the design syllabus design committee of several universities. He has designed the syllabus of cultural studies, trauma studies, disability theory, medical humanities, energy humanities. post-colonial literature shakespeare for the 21st century and research methodology his writings have been published in several anthologies including globalization reader nomadism reader asia literature in english films and literature conflict studies and race caste and gender he is on the studies He is a PhD supervisor for RTMNU that is Nagpur University and an examiner for several universities. He is an academic counselor for the creative writing course of IGNU. He was invited as an expert on drafting committee of NCCI's National Higher Education Policy. He has served as a subject expert on the selection committees for appointment of lecturers by St Stephen's College New Delhi. Xavier's College Mumbai and many other colleges 
He is a certified HRD trainer for TCS Bengaluru and has conducted several teacher and corporate training programs. He has delivered endowment lectures in University of Rochester, USA, Loyola College, Chennai, Jyoti Nivas College, Bengaluru, and Royal Bhutan University. He is a NAC expert and an RUSA trainer. He is an external advisor to RQAC of reputed colleges. His writings, he is also a poet and a short story writer. His books of short story, The Keeper of the Dead, won the CLR International Award for Best Experimental Fiction in 2021. His writings have been published in Sahitya Academy's Indian Literature, Little Magazine, Penn International Journal of Indian Poetry. He was featured as the poet of Fortnight in stanza of Femina Magazine. His poems have been shortlisted three times in All India Poetry Competition held by the British Council of India. His passion in teaching and researching, besides reading on literature, politics, sports, and culture, watching films, traveling, and cooking non veg dishes are his favorite pastime. He also loves to teach creative writing to youngsters and conduct workshops on research writing and methodology. I will also take this opportunity to just tell everybody else that I have had the golden opportunity to be his student and have been enlightened on many topics on literature by him. Now, with these thoughts in mind, I request Dr. Banerjee to commence with this lecture. Please. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andurema. Uh, thank you uh, for being the kind of student, being very sincere and obedient by a rule-breaking teacher. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, first of all, uh, I am extremely grateful uh, to Professor Savita Singh uh, for this to deliver the eighth edition of the late uh, Dr. J.B. Singh Memorial Talk. Um, I'm also thankful to the Eltai chapter, the Eltai Raipur chapter, the organizers of Eltai Raipur chapter for having me here, for having me virtually on this platform. Um, let me begin by paying my tributes to my homage to uh, the late uh, Dr. J.B. Singh, all the memories of uh, the people who knew him intimately and knew him so well, uh, clearly from their reminiscences and their nostalgic memories, uh, clearly he was a man of sterling qualities of uh, the head and the heart. and. Uh, my pranam and my shraddhanjali, my respect to him. Um, I uh, I was listening to the list of speakers of the previous uh, editions, and um, uh, once again, let me express my uh, uh, my heartfelt privilege, or rather, my my gratitude to to be invited to deliver this eighth edition of the late uh, Dr. J. B. Singh Memorial Talk. Um, Friends, um, I, you know, uh, let me dive straight into my talk. But before I do that, I thought I'll, uh, as the topic has already been spelled out for you, I thought I'm going to speak on uh, arts in the time of AI's Aristotle and uh, Hamlet's Android phone. Uh, but before I dive into the topic, uh, let me indulge you uh, and let me tell you a bedtime story. A bedtime story, but of course, not to put you to sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, let me start by spinning the story. You know, it's like, like all wonderful stories, uh, bedtime stories that we remember from childhood. Stories that begin with once upon a time. So once upon a time, once upon a time, let me say, in the realm of artificial, in the realm of artificial intelligence, <laughs> there, there lived a, 
uh, a mischievous language model named ChatGPT. So ChatGPT was known far and wide for its ability to generate text that seemed almost human-like. And so to continue the story forward, one day when ChatGPT was humming along, happily generating pieces of text, um, one, you know, suddenly out of the digital mist appeared the ghostly figure of Uwe Rola Bath, uh, looking, as one would expect, looking rather perplexed. Um, so Bath said, ah, chap GPT, there you are. I've heard about your textual prowess, but I must say, um, I have, Bath says, I have a bone to pick with you about my death of the author theory. Well, uh, to take the take this whimsical story forward, uh, ChatGPT quickly supplicated on the ground and replied, "Well, Mr. Barts, it's an honor to have you here, but you must understand that I'm just a humble AI language model. I'm just a, a large language model, and I don't really have the intentions, nor the desire, nor even the consciousness, like." we often credit like we credit to human authors so does your theory still apply does your theory of the death of the author still apply well Barth <laughs> raises an eyebrow and says uh, well perhaps this session i mean the one that is happening now perhaps this session on you and me and my dear friend michel foucault may answer your question so till then, hold your breath and listen to the talk carefully. And so, <laughs> using Bart's, <laughs> Bart's uncanny voice, what I wish to tell you, dear participants, those who have joined us, to list, to hold your breath and listen to me carefully. <laughs> well, friends, um, this rather fictional encounter that I thought, I thought I'll spin uh, between... Uh, AI or artificial intelligence and Rola Barthes uh, is not really just a ha-ha moment to begin my talk, which I have titled as uh, Arts in the Time of AI's Aristotle and uh, Hamlet's Android Phone. Uh, let me assure you that my purpose is no less serious and critical than theory is to the study of literature. Because, well, to parody, because if literature comes, can literary theory be far behind? So, uh, what I plan to do, friends, in this talk, uh, what I'm trying to do, what I will try to do, is to look at how um, how what I call the AI turn, the turn of the artificial intelligence turn, in our so-called post-human twenty-first century world, is bringing uh, what I call, what I feel strongly, is a radical shift on uh, fundamental ideas about. Who is an author? Who is a reader? What is a text? Or for that matter, what is literature itself? What is literature becoming? So the AI turn today um, is, um, I reckon, is proving, is going to prove, it's already proving, but it's going to even be, it's going to be even more disruptive. It's going to be more radical in its disruptiveness than, uh, shall I say, the, the, the post-structuralist and the post-modern turns uh, that we remember the last century by and um, uh, through what because i think the very narrative or ve the very discourse or rather the way in which we think what an author what a book or, or what a text or what literature is is being altered very very quickly very very swiftly and very very disruptively as i said through the thought altering narratives on the same subjects on the same on the same subjects that have that have engaged the the interest and the attention of previous literary theorists like uh, Rola Barth, Michel Foucault, or for that matter, Jacques Derrida. All about, all of them have completely have transformed the way we think about author, text, writing, or for that matter, discourse. So, um, you know, chat GPT, well, it's not just chat GPT, but if you think of any other language generative AI programs, they all started making headlines. When was it? As recently, uh, I think it was in 2022, the fall of 2022. And since then, since then, um, 
tetrabytes, you could say tetrabytes of arguments have been made both in the academia as well as in public forums, um, both in favor of AI mm, and against it. So some people, some people have seen or are seeing artificial intelligence as nothing more than an upgraded version of Wikipedia, um, whereas others uh, have considered it as a threat to our processes of thinking, our processes of writing, or shall I say our processes of create, creating something itself. So some have dismissed um, this very, um, uh, the, 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 the language generative ability of artificial intelligence, the algorithms of AI, as uh, some have dismissed it, some have negated it, almost like uh, that they are no better than actually a content copier uh, or let's say a language, uh, language imitator. Uh, but there are, uh, I mean, there are polarities. Uh, I mean, right now the verdict there is no one single verdict and there are people who are on opposite sides of the opinion poll. But there are others who have welcomed it uh, for, uh, uh, for welcomed artificial intelligence, I'm saying, for its uh, super abilities with what it can do with language, what it can do with writing, what it can do with text for that matter. So the big question really that I wish to put out to you at the very outset is this. Um, what do we think of chat GPT or what do we think of arcs in the time of chat GPT or for that matter, what do we think of uh, chat GPT itself? Is it a tool? Is it a toy, a kind of a high tech toy, a fancy, a fanciful toy or is it a travesty? And well, as a corollary to that question, um, on the flip side, um, you know, what whatever your position is regarding chat gpt or any ai language generative model uh, i'm throwing this question before you that are um, artificial intelligence these these large language models what are called llms literary production and literary consumption of this century i'll repeat what i said I said, we, I'm going to look for, uh, to try and look at um, whether chat GPT is a tool, a toy or a travesty and what does it do to our engagement with literature or our engagement with art, our engagement with creativity. And I would also um, like to look at whether, whether on the flip side, I, I'm going to look at uh, whether artificial intelligence and all language, large language models, the LLMs, are giving us uh, the black swan moment, the black swan moment of this century, which is akin to probably what Gutenberg did in the 15th century, inventing the printing press. So um, I think, um, let me, I thought I'll share a few slides with you. Uh, let me share them. Let me share my presentation with you. Just give me a minute. Do let me know if you can see my presentation. Yes, sir, we can see it. Great. All right. So, uh, friends, there you are. Mm, on the slide is the title. And I thought uh, I pulled these two images, of course, from the World Wide Web. Um, where else but to source it? And uh, as you can see, <laughs> it has um, AI's Aristotle and, of course, an Android phone uh, with uh, Hamlet or maybe Hamlet's iconic uh, scene stealer from the play itself. So, um, you know, somebody wrote, um, just hang on a minute. Yeah. The other day I saw somebody, um, or rather on, on our own WhatsApp, somebody posted a great comment on 
the very theme, the very question that I posed, uh, uh, what is what is uh, artificial intelligence doing to creativity, to art? And um, I think you must also have come upon this post. Mm, uh, it said, uh, if I remember correctly, it said that, we, you know, we don't need artificial intelligence. We don't need AI to make art. We need AI to write emails. We need AI to clean the house. We we need AI to deliver the grocery so humans can go ahead and uh, and and create more and more art. And I think uh, this is a very cryptic but telling comment uh, on the very very um, the very conflicting nature of today's topic. So um, if I if I I take this post if I take this post as a host or rather as a hook not just chat gpt is a tool toy or a travesty but if um, chat gpt is an author then what kind of an author is it and how does it write you know any one of us who have and most of us have already used uh, some ai tool or the other so chat gpt claims to write anything for us isn't it it can it it can compose sonnets it can compose uh, it can craft stories it can churn out uh, film scripts, it can write CVs, uh, uh, it can it can even prepare travel itineraries. And um, if you choose to ask questions, it can also give you answers on on extremely diverse and complex, uh, uh, complex subjects. Uh, so we may ask, we may ask, along with Bath, uh, we may ask, is it killing? Is AI killing the very idea of the author? the very idea of what we think an author is particularly the 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 philosophical tradition of thinking of the author as god the or as 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 both god as well as father father with a capital f so is um, ai killing uh, the very idea of author as godfather let me put it in this way is is AI killing the idea of the author as Godfather to an extent that even Rola Barth could not have predicted when he announced the death of the author in that landmark essay in 1968 in the John Hop, which he delivered as a as a speech in the John Hopkins University. So, um, you know, first of all, friends, first of all, if if you if if we think of Chat GPT as an author, it is to ask ourselves. Um, what kind of an author? Well, um, is it virtually a depersonalized author? Or shall I say, is it an unauthorized author? You know, there are, these are some of the fascinating things that I have been thinking about, and I thought I'll articulate them and place them before you. I do not for a minute uh, s submit that I have uh, answers to all these questions that I'm raising. Uh, you might think I'm a hell raiser of questions, but I do want to provoke you into thinking with me, thinking alongside me on some of the questions that has uh, that has that most social commentators and literary theorists are already engaging with in an extremely serious and uh, in an extremely serious and critical way. So um, if Chan GPT is an author, what I'm saying is, is it is it possible to think of it as a depersonalized author in the manner in which Rola Barth uh, put that thought across to us in the death of the author? Uh, you see, um, when you think of authors or when you think of a human author, when we read texts for that matter, when we read texts created by, uh, by uh, a human author, uh, we do want to know and understand the point of view of the author. We we do want to know the biases and the prejudices of that author. We do want to either agree or disagree or think along with the narratives of the author, isn't it? We want to know, for example, where are his ideas coming from? Uh, what are his biases? And also, what are the stakes? What are his stakes? Stakes of maybe politics, stakes of identity, stakes of cultural politics, etc., etc. So we know... we. When we when we think of an author, when we think of his writing, we are thinking about his agenda. We are thinking of motives, context, historical, ideological, political, cultural, and so on and so forth. So, um, so we, you know, our, our idea, our our conventional idea of an author is certainly is to make us uh, is to is to get into a confidential chat uh, 
uh, and to want to know if the author is being bitchy, if he's being euphoric, if he's being enigmatic uh, in his from his writings or in his writings. So, um, mm, is Chat GPT um, doing all that? Can we call Chat GPT an author in that conventional, traditional sense? Well, certainly, it's it's a it it requires a further examination but then just to give you another a different perspective of what a recent news that you see on the slide you see um google um very recently i think it was in feb this year feb this year that uh, uh, google changed the name of its own um, ai from it used to be called bard ai uh, b a r d of course you know uh, who it refers to. So Google had its own LLM calling it Bard AI. And then they changed the name as recently as in Feb 2024, calling it Gemini. And so uh, uh, this uh, really is interesting because when it gave to the AI too much of a personality, too much of a persona, and Google didn't want, Google didn't want, this is what uh, Pichai said that Google didn't want an AI to be our conversational, intimate, creative partner. You get my point. <laughs> so, um, you see, <laughs> Pichai's answer once again throws open a Pandora's box. It opens out a Pandora's box because, uh, I mean, as a side thought, when I, when I read the news, uh, I said, may the bard rest in peace. Because, uh, or else, you know, Pichai may have uh, angered Shakespeare in his grave. Uh, remember how the bard was original even in the epitaph that he left behind on his grave. What was it? Um, something like, you know, good friend for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. And then goes on to, the epitaph goes on to say something. I don't exactly remember the word. That blessed be the man that spares these stones. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves my bones. Well, Pichai almost did that, uh, but thank God he removed, uh, he turned, he changed Bard AI to Gemini. So, coming back to that question, uh, uh, do we think of Chat GPT? When we think of Chat GPT, if we think of Chat GPT as an author, do we think of it as a single? Should we think of it as a single depersonalized author then? Or taking this train of my thought forward, should we think of any AI text, any AI generative program as um, as a as a collective of authors, as a tribe of authors? as a community of authors, and I'll just explain what I mean by that. You see, um, chat GPT, or for that matter, any other algorithm, or rather any other AI, uh, they do exemplify the notion of the text as a kind of an interactive construct, interactive and collaborative construct, with who writes a text is not an author, it is an author writes a book, but he who writes a text is a scripter. But I don't want to go into the distinction in between a scripter and an author. Why? Because I assume that. Going back to this point, you see, uh, a single a single AI generated text, friends, is is the creative. Yeah, you could call it a creative. It, it's like a creative collation of vast amounts of data that thousands of users feed online every day, and that includes. I mean, of course, that includes you and I. So with ChatGPT, when you say um, uh, you know, write, write or uh, ma write an essay on Planck's theory, quantum theory. Uh, you know, Chat GPT will do an amazingly good job at that. I mean, I probably absorbing by pulling out, uh, pulling in rather every single text, every single sentence that is available on the text. Um, it is therefore it kind of makes us question: uh, Is Chat GPT both original and not original is it original or not original because it becomes simply it because it, one way of thinking about chat gpt or ai is to think about it as a replicator or a duplicator of all th of all things that we already know but not just know all things that are there on the net 
So is if ChatGPT is an author, it's is it a depersonalized author? Is it a tribalized? <laughs> you have used uh, uh, also used uh, LLMs, uh, and you. I have been stunned about how the algorithm works without having no knowledge of computer science, no knowledge of how really big data works as a simple gram or as the algorithm creates sentences as it's a sort of uh, tough to identify and, you know, takes that don't really tell us whether it. So uh, just to test out the many questions uh, that AI poses. Uh, I place before you uh, what is a text, what is literary writing, who is a reader, what does it do to the very idea of literature. So uh, both Rola Barth as well as Michel Foucault. And so, it, you know, I'm trying to bring these gentlemen alive or shall I say <laughs> bringing gentlemen alive? Well, I'm trying to revive and resurrect them and trying to make some intricate connections between what these two gentlemen said, what these two theorists said. Uh, big ideas, big ideas, all the way ba back in 1968, to be precise, and um, um, and what we are talking about, what literary commentators, critical theorists, literary commentators, and cultural thinkers are talking about. The same questions, even after so many decades. So, um, what I, I, I therefore would like you to look at is, um, yeah, whether we are talking of artificial intelligence or other, or are we talking about artificial ignorance? I told you I'm going to be a hell raiser. I'm going to keep raising questions. Uh, don't expect, and I, and I don't really have the answers. I don't really have the answers because uh, much like the free floating, uh, a network of free floating signs, as Derrida would say, I uh, one set of one question leads to an infinite number of other questions and other questions. And so, but, but, but this is precisely the reason. Uh, so, um, uh, is artificial, is AI, does, do, do we really need to look at AI not merely as artificial intelligence or artificial ignorance? Well, just to recap, <laughs> the, the, the already, um, uh, huge number of questions that I've raised. Mm. So what we are asking friends is, is ChatGPT an author or is it just a language machine? Is ChatGPT a depersonalized or some kind of an unauthorized author? And if we accept that AI is an author, then who generates the words? Who creates these words? And what words? And, and, and then uh, what is our role? Or, uh, our role as you, as, as both producers and consumers, are we all ghostwriters? Do we all become ghostwriters by putting, by writing our stuff and putting it on the net? Do we all become ghostwriters for chat GPT? Isn't it? So, and, and uh, how like or unlike is a bot, therefore, uh, a chat bot uh, from Bart's author? Should we think of ChatGPT not as a single author, but perhaps a community of authors, something that I've already touched upon? Well, these are all these set of questions, and this is not an exhaustive list. It actually, I, we can add, we, there can be so many other questions, but well, um, I've just raised a hornet's nest, so it seems, uh, but clearly, uh, we, we, are way, uh, we are far from having answers. But that makes the very process of engaging with the notion of artificial intelligence and what it is doing to our ideas of writing, our ideas of creativity, such a fascinating field of today's times. Hmm. Well, I've already said uh, about Pichai renaming uh, Bard AI as Gemini, so uh, couldn't resist the pun. Uh, was Pichai Googling or was he needling the Bard? Uh, okay. All right. Um, you know, I gave a prompt just to test out some of my own spec to chat GPT. Uh, a very simple prompt um, asking it to prepare a mission statement for our university. You know how, uh, how our... Uh, Universities and colleges often ask us, make us uh, 
rewrite or re-envision the mission and vision statements well. Um, so I'm going to give you two samples. Uh, one is the one on your on the slide right away. Uh, uh, take 20 seconds maybe to read it. Okay, here comes the next one. Well, here comes uh, a modified version of the Alan Turing test I was telling you about. I, I want you, well, this is a question that I'm posing to you all. Uh, which one do you think is um, an AI uh, text, and which one is a is by a human author? And that seems like an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> human author. Uh, just checking whether, uh, you know, I began by saying I'm going to spin a bedtime story. Just checking whether people are here alert with me. I think the second one. Uh, the second one is what, sir? It appears to be AI generated <laughs> uh, and not the original one. Okay. Um, so just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I mean, uh, you you see, it's not a KBC question, <laughs> so there are no prizes for guessing. But you know, <laughs> at least at least to my ears, uh, you know, the first statement sounded less human. <laughs> Even you know, to say the statement, to make a statement like this, is to look at the entire uh, the entire philosophy and tradition uh, that has uh, that keeps changing our very notion of what is human particularly when we say that we are in a post-human age. But anyway, let's not get into that. But uh, the simple reason I say that the first statement sounded less human and the second one seemed to be a little more direct. Why? Because um, to me, it, it focused on the students, you know, calling it, uh, to me, it seemed uh, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> uh, 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 a, human, a human thing because it talked about students as a person, a student as a person, you know, well-rounded, critical thinkers. Uh, uh, but then, but then, uh, these were both web prompts, general AI or author, <laughs> and that is what comes completely foxes you. The ability of uh, uh, large language models, the very algorithms that create patterns and give you multiple choices, and uncanny, uncanny, uncannily. Well, that's finally I got it. Uncannily, it makes the text that uh, the AI produces, the algorithms, we actually reverse our opinion and say, well, AI is nothing more than a copier, a content copier, because it gives us a text which is, as I said, uh, if we think likewise, it is something dull, trite, and uh, and boring. So, um, uh, look, look, uh, you know, every time we are on the net, every time we post something on the on Twitter, every time we post something on a Reddit account, every time we post something on Facebook, every time we the, we upload our photos uh, or write a blog or code um, a source, or for that matter, every time we look up or write or post or upload academic articles and journal papers, even those that we access, everything becomes. Um, uh, GPTs, everything becomes fodder to jab, chat GPT's cavernous omnivorous appetite. Because it, it kind of extracts data from everybody who has contributed to the World Wide Web. And no, and no wonder, therefore, that the World Wide Web is called the digital commons. The first term that was used for World Wide Web was called digital commons. So, um, can it again, here comes another question uh, for us to think that each one of us who put out our stuff on the net every day, perhaps in a, uh, can we, can we, uh, are we actually in a small way becoming a content writer or a ghost writer for AI? 
Because all the stuff that you and I put on, put out there in Siberia may be used by a chatbot tomorrow, uh, thereby robbing us not only of our, uh, <laughs> of our lines, but also of our individuality, of our creativity. So is AI therefore creating a human subject, a new human subject? You see, it's interesting to think on these lines. And clearly you can see that it's not, we are no longer talking about a, a machine that, that collects, collates, and then predicates on that data and creates further data. It's no longer a machine because what it does, what its capacities and its potentialities does is to lead us to larger, deeper, metaf shall I say, metaphysical questions of who, what was a human, what is a human, and what will the human become? something that you will know Harari posed in these wonderful books, uh, the two books that he wrote. Uh, he wrote many, but specifically these two books. And I would say that if you, you know, those of us who are familiar with his works, I mean, to, 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 to connect what I just said regarding AI and how it is reconstructing or recreating or reinventing the very notion of who we are or what it is to be a human, let us say from the last century for, for over a period of 100 years, then maybe we could say, or for that matter, the entire the entire history, human history, I'm saying. So maybe uh, taking, uh, taking Harari's uh, titles of his two books, you could, somebody like Descartes who said, Cogito ergo sum, to, I think, therefore I am. And so if organisms are turning algorithms, are becoming algorithms, you and I become feed, daily feeds for AI and its generative text. But then, is that all, I mean, uh, is that all uh, so very dismal and pessimistic? Are we creating a kind of a night, am I even, you know, giving you a sense of foreboding sense of a nightmarish dystopian world where we are nothing more than data packets. Well, that is precisely the kind of Barthesian conundrum, you know, uh, the, the questions that Barth, Rona Barth raised in, in his uh, critical writings. So, connecting Hamlet to Barth and Barth to AI, to chatbots, to bot or not to bot. To recap what we have done so far, if ChatGB called an author, is it a de depersonalized author, an unauthorized author? And also we've looked at, we've looked at them, probably leading us to more questions uh, as I come up in a short time. Okay. So it is to migrate, mm. to look at, um, you know, there was so much talk, almost like Jay and Viru. If you think of Rola Bath, you think, if you think of Jay, you're thinking of Viru. And if you're thinking of Rola Bath, how can you forget Michel Foucault? So <laughs> uh, Foucault, we all remember his essay, don't we? What is an essay? Not who is, uh, sorry, what is an author? Not who is an author, what is an author? Um, he wrote this essay a, a year after Rola Barth wrote The Death of the Author. And so, uh, like Barth, essentially what Foucault was doing, he was trying to de de debunk, he was trying to dismantle the whole Western tradition of the metaphysics of, an, of logocentricism. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the thought that celebrates the author, he was dismantling this idea of the author as a transcendental signifier signified rather that the author that the author is the single originator of a text meaning that the author is both the uh, both the beginning and the end of all significance so for foucault the author um, you know rather he, he reduced the author to what he called an author function and this is exactly how he described it. The quote is there on the slide. We can easily imagine, he said, we can easily imagine a culture where discourse would circulate without any need for an author, where discourses, whatever their status, form or value, and regardless of your manner of handing them, would unfold in a pervasive anonymity. 
precisely in a way, in a sense, I'm, I hope you can see the resonance with the question that I had raised earlier, where, whether if AI is a depersonalized author, if we can call it an author in terms of its generative, its ability to generate text. And here is Foucault describing what the author is, not as a, not as an embodied flesh and blood author, but as an author function. So, you know, we, it's possible to argue, at least to me, it is possible that we might argue that AI like Chad GPT is a social construct in a Foucauldian way. And because and, and therefore it can demonstrate, you know, for Foucault, uh, knowledge was power and power and power, therefore, was power seeped, absorbed, spread through its invisible net networks. It was like a capillary action. The nature of the exercise of power, the nature of the dissemination of power is essentially something that is invisible, but at the same time ubiquit ubiquitous. It is both omnipresent as well as omniscient. And so Foucault called it the apparatus of power. So, you know, uh, let's not forget, friends, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make a connection between AI, the, the very nature of the operation of AI with the Foucauldian sense of what he calls the apparatuses or the regimes of power. I'm, connect, I'm trying to connect these two ideas. And, and to me, it appears AI, a company, a company, um, a profit, fundamentally a profit making company, and therefore a company whose product, or rather, yeah, a company whose product like ChatGPT is subject to copyright and patent laws as well as to infringement. Look what's happening. In recent times, what's happening today is that already both Google as well as OpenAI, the two big, big, uh, big boys of uh, AI, yeah. what they have started to offer is there are pre are there AI premium versions for for us to pay and use premium versions. So already there are hierarchies already by the operation of you can make that connection how AI can be related to Foucault's apparatuses, the operation of apparatuses of power or regimes of knowledge, which are creating a, hi a hierarchical form of discriminatory uses and possessions of knowledge. Our very access to what will be data is being, um, uh, is being uh, firewalled by, uh, by, making, by turning it into a PayPal um, uh, platform. So, what does it really mean? I mean, uh, one can actually think of uh, uh, some serious repercussions of what AI is, what AI like ChatGPT and uh, 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 premium Google are doing. Well, isn't it an, another, in one sense, a form of Orwellian uh, thought control? Something that he put up in 1984? you know, or for that matter, what is, I mean, what is thought control, if not the deep fakes that are being created by AI today? Because anything that can organize, manipulate, uh, maneuver, human human senses, human values, and human represent, uh, human expressions is, is a system of both doublespeak as well as thought control. And this is what uh, George Orwell said or wrote in this, uh, in this dystopian fiction. So, well, you know, the point, the larger point, friends, that I'm trying to make is that, you know, greater, the more advanced and greater the use of technology, the greater is the scope of its misuse and abuse. And not for the first time. A I'll just give you an example, um, a recent case that I, uh, that I read. Uh, where else but on the net? Just hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, uh, was about, um, uh, you know, a new law which was passed by school authorities sometime in 21 or 22, I don't exactly remember, uh, but it talk that age appropriate to the level of children uh, who were in the school. Now, 
one particular school, and that this became a very, very controversial case. Therefore, I remember one particular school overzealous, shall we say, administration, you know, they vetted their entire library holdings by using, guess what, by using chat GPT as their sensor board. Oops. <laughs> they left it to artificial intelligence and not to human, in, to their own intelligence to identify uh, those books that uh, that they thought should be uh, uh, kept in the library and those books that should be remo removed. And what is what is interesting is is this that uh, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Uh, so, uh, friends, uh, Chat GPT is it therefore the biggest plagiarist? Is AI the biggest plagiarist? Well, I told you there are larger, larger economics of the market as well as the politics of discriminatory, or rather, the ideologies of uh, capitalist markets as well as the politics of discriminatory judgments that are at play here, and we are therefore. We, we are not just looking about artificial intelligence, we are looking at artificial intelligence and their impact upon us as individuals and as well as members of a society. So, um, you know, um, all right, uh, let me, uh, well, I think I'll skip this. So, um, if you ask, um, you know, whether Chat GPT can write my, uh, can it write my novel, my next, your next novel or my next novel, can it write my next research paper? Well, Salman Rushdie was asked the same question very recently. <laughs> that can Chat can Chat GPT actually copy a style of yours? Oh well, let I think I moved my slide. Where was it? Yeah, is AI the biggest plagiarist? So Rushdie was asked whether. Chad GPT could actually plagiarize his writing style. Um, you know what Rusty said? He said, uh, uh, he said, well, he did. He actually asked uh, Chad GPT to uh, write 200 words, only 200 words in his own style. And uh, the result, he said, was uh, just a bunch of what Chad GPT recreated or produced, uh, generated is the proper word. What Chad GPT generated was what Rusty said is a was a bunch of nonsense <laughs> and then went on to say that no one no reader who had read even a single page of my book think that i was the author and not uh, um, more formulaic writers uh, uh, <laughs> formulaic writers well probably he was having a dig at uh, people like john the john grishams and uh, uh, the stephen kings those who produce uh, or for that matter those who produce medical thrillers or sci-fi he said um, Chat, uh, the the problem, the trouble with uh, Chat GPT or these he called them creatures is that they they learn very they're learning very quickly, and so um, it's worrying for not for uh, writers like him, but he said that uh, it's worrying definitely for those who write uh, popular fiction or pulp fiction thrillers, as I said, or for that matter, science fiction. So, um, all right, here we go. Let me move ahead. Um, Yeah. So back to school or back to college. Let me take you back to school or back to college. Mm. Uh, is artificial intelligence the death of the college essay or the school essay? Remember what we what we got in school, write a model essay on is science a blessing or a curse? Well, if I if 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 we were put to the test to write an essay, is AI a boon or a bane? Well, <laughs> we are back to school. Uh, well, AI and what it is doing to education beats to follow. So ever since Chan GPT and AI Bard uh, arrived on the scene, schools and college administrations, uh, uh, we, we are not, uh, we teachers are, we just is <laughs> the AI nor our students who, team, who's, who seem to be increasingly uh, 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 using AI tools. So uh, should we ban? Should we bar? Uh, what do we do? Um, interestingly, um, <laughs> in response to um, write something on the 5th of September, coinciding it with Teacher's Day, 
um, two years back, I think. And uh, it was published in the Times of India, the national edition. And not surprisingly, I plagiarized, uh, well, Shakespeare and AI to say, to bot or not to bot a teacher's open letter to a student. Um, well, <coughs> we, uh, what is, you know, uh, let me come to the last part. Um, I, uh, try, I'll try my best to bring all everything and so much of uh, questions that I've raised, hopefully to string them, pull them all together uh, into some kind of conclusion. A conclusion there, uh, I dare say, without, without any full stops. Um, you know, so it's like asking, what is all this malarkey about <laughs> author, essay, chat GPT, theory in the time, uh, in today's time? And how does it all add up uh, for the arts and uh, the humanities? Well, um, look, I talking about AI, talking about AI and its impact on uh, on the academia in general and the way in which we are transacting our college curriculum. Uh, on a, on a, on many a forum, it's kind of be become my pet bug. AI has become my pet bug, uh, you could say, or my hobby horse uh, that I like. <coughs> uh, and, but you, you see, I'm reminded of one of the most important 20th century work, which was written by a British scientist and novelist, C.P. Snow. And the work that I'm referring <coughs> to is uh, something called The Two Cultures. The two C.P. Snow wrote this uh, wonderful book called The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution in 1959 and where you know where he argued something that we still are arguing about a hundred years later we are arguing about what he said in that book was uh, it is fundamentally that you know that the science and the science technology and the humanities that at one point in time represented the intellectual uh, life of the whole western society he said he felt had become split in a post industrial in an industrialized in a rapidly industrialized market dominated technologically driven society of the mid 20th century and he said that this entire philosophy intellectual tradition which was coherent which was organic and which was united had become split into two cultures this was the title of the book the two cultures and one culture uh, to him represented by professional scientists and the other represented uh, by literary intellectuals in other words, the split was basically between science and technologists on the one hand, scientists and technologists on the one hand, and of course, lit, uh, writers and artists on the other. Mm -hmm. And therein, according to him, uh, this it is this split, it's this division between um, between our pursuit of knowledge in the classification and hierarchy, hierarchization of knowledge, knowledge turning knowledge. Uh, into different domains and and confining them into various silos it is this split that, <coughs> it is this split that made the world according to cp snow incapable of solving its prefer to this 1959 uh, essay precisely because what you see on the slide uh, is something that richard holmes uh, um, recently uh, uh, you know in his very very intriguingly titled book the age of wonder how the romantic generation discovered the beauty and terror of science the beauty and terror of science and he gives these wonderful examples some of some of which i have uh, uh, put on that slide you know he talks about computational biology holmes is talking about in his book he's talking about computational biology and he says is futuristic something that is uh, we are envisioning a new age of biology in which uh, and yeah he says he's saying uh, and i'm uh, and i quote he says a new this <coughs> writing genomes as fluently as blake and byron wrote verses whose touch with science like the poets of the earlier age of wonder now I find a remarkable, co a remarkable coincidence, or rather a remarkable connection between what C.P. Snow was writing 80 years back, calling it the two cultures and the scientific revolution, and what Holmes is posing in, in, a, in a recent book of his, of his, drawing our attention to the convergence, not to the divergence, but, the con but to the necessity of the convergence between with arts and humanities. And this is my this is the big thesis of my talk, uh, shall I say. Uh, 
And so he gives examples of how the Romantic Age, when we talk, he's talking about 19th century Romantic Age, and he says that the Romantic Age, you know, we literature teachers talk about the Romantic Age, we are talking about German Enlightenment or German Romanticism, and we bring in our Keats, Coleridge, Shelley, and Wordsworth. But what he draws our attention is uh, to this marvelous synchronicity between the, between, let's say, Keats's writings, Keats's odes, and or Keats's poetry, and his interest in science, because had it was Keats, Keats would not have re, would not have written, you know, uh, the excitement written about uh, written a poem on his excitement and his sense of wonder about on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Remember that poem? That was triggered. That was kind of uh, inspired by his. Um, by his excitement over uh, the discovery of a new planet, Uranus. So, uh, Holmes gives us uh, many such examples to draw the, to draw our attention to the way forward in to the way forward of not just AI, artificial intelligence, but to show us the way forward between, uh, let us say, science, technology, and humanities uh, in the coming years the convergence and not the divergence. And this, I say, is a very, very disruptive thought for us to take it forward, to engage with it. Well, um, so, uh, so what are we thinking of humanities now in the age of AI's Aristotle and uh, Hamlet's smartphone? As you might have guessed, I'm wrapping up my talk by coming back to the title uh, of of my of today's discourse so what are we even going to think about uh, the humanities uh, I, you know patricia cohen i was reading a book uh, by her or rather an article by her in the new york times and she says that the history of humanism or rather the history of the humanities in the 20th century is what she calls a series of um, uh, 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 a series of you know, a chronicle of isms. So you can think of the many isms, you can think of formalism, you can think of Freudianism, you can think of structuralism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, post-humanism, it's all the isms. And basically, uh, she draws our attention that, you know, the, the entire tradition of 20th century humanities thought is built up on the grand intellectual cathedrals, which sort of uh, you know, of which which revolves around these isms, and it is these isms that have allowed us, or that has enabled us, to make the many interpretations of what we think of literature, what we think of politics, what we think of our culture. So, what is, if you ask me, um, you know, um, along with Patricia Cohen, what is the big idea of today's millennial? this new millennia. What will be the big idea that will become the game changer in the way big data and artificial intelligence, of course. But instead of looking at new, looking for new isms, Cohen argues, and I tend to agree with her, uh, is that we should start looking more and more at the intersections between technology and arts, between literature and computer science. So, um, you know, yes, we also need to be wary that there shouldn't be too much digital and too little humanities in, uh, well, in, in, a, in, in digit something in a course like in a new curriculum or a new domain of, in, of interdisciplinary, what we call digital humanities. Uh, all right. So, um, my take, you know, when we think of these... Uh, very novel, very innovative, very cutting, well, cutting edge humanities uh, discipline now called DH or uh, digital humanities. Um, my take on it is that, yes, um, it can, uh, digital humanities can make a very important contribution to literature and language studies of the f in the present as well as in the future, provided we part of uh, uh, digital humanities. Um, uh, because frankly, let with everything that begins with an E, by that I mean electronic, frankly we should not get carried away with anything that has digital or artificial and forget what are the strengths of humanities.
So let me end by making, by bringing before you, uh, before you, uh, a classic, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, I end with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein because, um, you see, we all know the story, don't we? I mean, in what was Mary's uh, story all about? It was about Frankenstein, a brilliant scientist who kind of learns to create life by joining and animating body parts uh, that he steals from cadavers. Uh, what he creates, what he ends up creating is a monster and, and we know how the story goes, that he's so appalled by his own creation that he wants to destroy the demon. For me, um, the real question that Mary Shelley makes me think or should make us think from her story is not what we humans can make, but how do we care for what we have made? Friends, the new humanities in all their digital avatars, in all their AI avatars, or shall I call AI arts, AI arts or digital humanities is already here and happening now. The challenge is, what will we do with it? Will we take responsibility for it or will we forsake it like Frankenstein, Frankenstein does to his monster? I leave you with this question hopefully, to sleep over it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Really excellent. Enjoyed every moment. I just knew you were going to come to Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> Frankenstein was there in my mind somehow. Yeah, and you came and ended with that. Yes, sir. Excellent. Excellent, sir. Please post the questions in the chat. Make sure that they are short and relevant. You'll be in the um, YouTube, I think. No? I suppose I have, I, have, they will I have. I have no questions. I have myself exhausted you all with. <laughs> I don't think they'll have any questions, you know, because it's um, they've been this. Uh, Swamped and stunned by the questions. Yes, uh, Shukla sir has raised his hand. Yes, yeah. please go ahead. So it's a wonderful lecture for me. Uh, being a person who is not so much connected with English literature as such, being a man of history, I found it really very, very enlightening for me. And uh, you threw probably more questions than you answered. And you said somewhere down the lane that probably uh, I, I'm putting across a lot of questions to you all. One point that came, in fact, a few, quite a few points are there that I noted, but one of them is when you talked about conversion of AI with humanity, then science and technology with a vis or computer with a vis humanity. The, the, the question is that uh, when, uh, when this computer came, there were a lot of worries about how the teaching inside classroom will change, will shape. Uh, will it be good for teachers, beneficial, and all that. When Google came, the question came over the existence of library. But one thing was certain that man became a walking library himself. So that was an improvement over the previous times, instead of going to the library. Now, how do you see, though you said, somewhere and then you ended up with Frankenstein thing. But the question is, in this conversion, do you see that humanities will be predominant with AI or AI uh, will sort of uh, take over the other aspects? Right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, um, I think uh, any Technology in any shape, whether it is AI or uh, the smartphones, the smart cars, uh, you name it, anything that has smartness to it is going to, our entire lives are going to be mediated. What we think, what we do, what, how, what we eat, how we dress, which books we read. You see, you know, everything is already being mediated through technology. And so, um, 
I think humanities will have to handhold or rather uh, reinvent itself, constantly reinvent itself, re-engineer, let me put it in this way, that humanities as, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a pursuit of, as a particular pursuit of knowledge would have to completely, constantly reinvent and re-engineer itself. It, otherwise, you see, um, uh, what is the re what? How do we make ourselves relevant to today's millennials? You talked about the classroom scenario. Our students, our learners, who are digital natives, and we who are trying to, you know, become digital migrants, we who are trying to update ourselves. So it, it's a question of our very survival, if I may put it. And there is a crisis already that is uh, threatening the study of humanities. Mm. Uh, uh, shortage of funding, uh, not many teachers, not many bright minds uh, taking up uh, humanities as a subject of study and becoming, let's say, English teachers like it, like we used to do in the past. Already humanities are in a crisis and the only way, you, you, once again, is not to go to the Wailing Towers and turn it into a kind of a Babel, but basically to, to, to upgrade ourselves, to constantly look at these new technologies, because we need to move with these new technologies. We need to reinvent our entire, um, the way in which we, we think something about literature itself in a, in a uh, aligned and allied with these disciplines. I always believe that, you know, today, when we walk into the classroom, um, what what are our expectations of our learners? Our learners want to be uh, want to be trained in multiple intelligences, uh, multiple a set of multiple intelligences, and a set of multiple intelligence. I mean, is that we need to impart this kind that kind of knowledge, and in such a way where uh, they have uh, linguistic intelligence with, let us say, kinesthetic or spatio intelligence. They have intrapersonal intelligence with interpersonal intelligence they have intellectual well eq with sq mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, 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 you name it so uh, the the way ahead is to think across disciplines uh contradisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity uh, rather than once again uh, rather than to continue um continue to be uh, shall i say uh, ostriches uh, with our necks buried in the sun. Right, true. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else? On a lighter note, sir, I had read somewhere. Uh, rather than AI, artificial intelligence, we should be still worried more about. Uh, human stupidity, natural or, stupidity. Or, uh, you know, for all the chitter chatter, or shall I pun on that word chat, right? I've been talking about chat GPT, chat GPT. For all the chitter chatter or chat about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, where is the narrative on artificial wisdom? Yes. Yeah. And that, because wisdom cannot be artificial, can it be? No. <laughs> never be. Uh, speaking about uh, being on the lighter side, can I just say two lines? Uh, beautiful lines are there. Enough of science and art. Enough of science and art. Close up those barren leaves. Both science and art looks to be barren. Enough of science and art. Close up those barren leaves. Come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. You become recipient to what's going on around nature. Beautiful. Well, that that's what I had to say. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more thing I'm just reminded, I think a uh, couple of uh, days back, or maybe a week back, I was reading in the speaking tree. I read the Times of India. So there was this, uh, uh, that Bill Gates was talking about AI, and then uh, the person with whom he was conversing, he said, AI is I. I means mother. So the entire, the, the article began with AI and mother, I. And Maharashtra, they said, oh, I is mother. So with the idea of mother okay. and AI, and then the, that how the mother and the intelligence that she gives to a child is actually what uh, the child becomes. 
So it was a very, very interesting beginning to a spiritual actual topic. So what we've been saying that you know, so multiple intelligences is there. I think a decade back it had just come into discussions now. Yeah, yeah. About a decade back, I think multi we started talking lots about it. But now it is there and the child demands it. Well, I can see talking about intelligences, I can see a lot of my intelligent students, uh, uh, former students, past students who have joined us, madam. Um, uh, there is Smita, there is Ankita, Dora, they all, uh, they all, all are from uh, this, the same school of thought. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Very interesting, sir. Whatever you said, very interesting. There's lots of questions. And this is something that, uh, and when you said that we are migrants, you know, we are just learning certain things. Uh, and uh, our students and the kids at home are far, far ahead. So I had to, uh, I was uh, in our English language society, I conduct some minute through karti hai, ek minute mein banwata hoon. <laughs> he got 20 questions framed. Out of that, there were six or seven of them that were repetitive. I said, my God, this is awful. I would never ever make these questions. You know, uh, yeah. Things were being asked. Yeah. Exactly. Somehow I, I got, I really uh, got irritated looking at it. No, as as, uh, to, as yeah, thinking is good. Anything, Ravindra? Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, AI and all that when you are doing your animation and all that. So, uh, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Uh, it hasn't like uh, entered that deep, but you know, like everybody is thinking about it, right? It's not something uh, it's like elephant in the room you cannot <laughs> ignore it so you know it's, it's very interesting um from like even like um uh, arts uh, you know like fine arts and like all the the creative art uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint because i see a lot of people um a lot of artists like really accomplished artists like really panicking and you know like thinking about oh, what's going to happen mm -hmm. and you know really like uh, rea starting to react to it um, um mm -hmm. you, you know just putting out posts about how this is not good and this and that like uh, I personally i feel like like first of all people need to uh, need to take a deep breath and you know like not stress too much about it because it's i think it's like a mm. right now it's like the the dust you know the whirlwind it's it's such a new thing that people aren't even grasping what it is so maybe let the dust settle and you know like um uh, hopefully people will uh, because you know the the smart people are um, starting to think about okay how can we use this to our advantage right like we are we human technology to assist in certain things that you're not good at or you know like and obviously the whole ethical question is like it's such a broad and it's such a, a deep topic here because you know like if it's if it uh, if it's like scouring all the internet and you know like collecting all the data that is not authorized then you know it, it brings a legality kind of a thing and that that is plagiarism and that is not like something uh, but but could you take that technology and you know like train on a, on your own data set you know if, if um and, you know and then train it to be certain like data that you are authorized and can you use it in a way that you know that can help you kind of because I, you know personally i i tend to think about uh how like contemporary artists might have felt uh, the, you know the painters and um when uh, cameras, uh, you know, came out, like uh, probably they were also scared that maybe out of, uh, you know, at least some of them, right? Like mm -hmm. that they would be out of jobs and, you know, they're like. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, it's still there, like. I think that is a connectivity and you know, like all the <laughs> we always cling to. Thanks. I think we'll, <laughs> I think we'll see. Okay, how can we use this uh, <clears throat> to our advantage? Oh, oh, hello. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Are you able to hear me? Sir? Yes, we could. Oh, sorry. I Oh, I, I thought my voice broke. Okay. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, just like my personal, this thing that, yeah, maybe we need to just like 
try to think of ways of how we can use it. Uh, and definitely the ethical questions are there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ravin, sir. Uh, once again, thank you, Prantik, sir, to take us to a journey right from Aristotle to Bard to artificial intelligence and Frankenstein. It was, it was indeed uh, a dream journey, like it's traveling. In fact, uh, browsing in a true sense. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Into high tide. Thank you. So before I, I would like to uh, read out a poem by uh, Sardar Ali Sardar Ali Sardar Jafri. Fir ek din aisa aayega, aankhon ke diye bujh jayenge, haathon ke kabal kumlaenge, aur bhula di jayegi, yadon ke hasi butthane se, har cheez utha di jayegi. फिर कोई नहीं ये पूछेगा सरदार कहाँ है मैं फिल में लेकिन मैं फिर आऊँगा बच्चों के दहन से बोलूँगा चिड़ियों की जबान से गाऊँगा बीज हसेंगे धरती में और कोपले अपनी उंगली से मिट्टी की तहों को छेड़ेंगी मैं पत्ती पत्ती कली कली अपनी आँखें फिर खोलूँगा सर सब्ज हथेली पर लेकर शबनम के कतरे तोलूँगा रुखसार और रूस की तरह हर आंचल से छन जाऊंगा रह रहो के जबा कदमों के तले सूखे हुए पत्तों से मेरे हंसने की सदाएं आएंगी धरती की सुनहरी सब नदियां आकाश की नीली सब झीलें हस्ती से मेरे भर जाएंगी मैं एक तड़पता कतरा हूँ मसरूफ सफर जो रहता है मैं सोता हूँ और जागता हूँ और जाग के फिर सो जाता हूँ सदियों का पुराना खेल हूं मैं मैं मर के अमर हो जाता सो विद दीज लाइंस नाउ आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर स्मिता शर्मा टू डिलीवर द वोट ऑफ थैंक्स डॉक्टर स्मिता शर्मा फॉर बेसिक साइंसेस मैम ओवर टू यू प्लीज थैंक यू डॉक्टर पनिकर अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग एंड शुभ नवरात्रि टू ऑल द रिस्पेक्ट dear professors dignitaries and my friends i dr smita sharma of thanks in this auspicious event dr jb singh memorial lecture series i'd like to start my uh, i would like to start by thanking eltai and our loving and respected dr savita ma'am for bringing us all together here today to make this event successful i on behalf of eltai and the organizers of the lecture series would like to extend my heartfelt heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed chief speaker professor prantik banerji for great presentation on artificial intelligence today sir you not only provided us with a comprehensive overview of artificial intelligence but also delved into its practical applications across the world your expertise and knowledge have undoubted by you in preparing and delivering such an informative and engaging session once again a heartfelt thank you to benerji sir for your enlightening presentation on artificial intelligence we are grateful for your contribution to enhance our knowledge and understanding in this ever evolving field i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for mr vishwadeep shukla and mr ravindra divedi for taking all of us to the company of our loving and respected dr jb singh sir and made us all feel as if we were company with honorable jb singh sir through some memorable incidents mr shukla and mr divedi's elegance of explanation of the memory of dr jb singh sir deserves our deepest sense of gratitude and appreciation i also wish to express my gratitude to our respected banerji ma'am sunaina ma'am and harsh sharma sir who have always been with all of us to organize this session and motivated us throughout and helped in the org organization of the talk i am immensely grateful to dr ravi shankar panikar for his strong effort to conduct this successful session my special thanks to mrs miss anorema das for her pivotal contribution to make this session successful i express my special thanks to the people who contributed to our event the organizers participants and the technical team 
to run online sessions smoothly. Finally, I would like to thank all of you present here for making the time to be with us today and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you one and all. I would like to say something to Shukla Madam, respected Shukla Ma'am. Ma'am, we all extremely uh, miss Banerjee, sir. His graceful presence, his smiling face, and his outstanding paintings this time. I pay my sincere tribute to Banerjee, sir. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you once again to all of you. Thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you, Banerjee sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.